in that well and uh, that there is a lot of people uh, struggling with uh, lockdowns. Okay, thank you, Silamon. Uh, the next uh, guest is Giovanni, Giovanni Sanesi from the University of Bari in Italy, uh, thematic coordinator for urban forestry in the, the Working Party. Um, organizer of the International Conference of this Working Party in 2006 in the Puglia region in Italy. Ciao Giovanni, welcome to the webinar. The same question for you, how was your Thanks, life in, in, the, in the last Joao. month? Thanks my friend and colleagues. Uh, if I can, uh, I, I would like to speak uh, just a bit more about my experience because uh, to be honest, my experience with the COVID-19 uh, really not directly, but uh, in a very huge sense, uh, begins in mid-February. I attended a uh, participated two days conference in South Italy, where I had colleagues coming from uh, all the parts of, uh, of Italy, also coming from Lombard region. After uh, one of the red zone of the coronavirus in Italy, after a very few days, uh, several colleagues felt ill. Uh, some uh, went into hospital in the intensive care and one died. So for me, after this event, my life changes completely. And I had, uh, I had a direct perception of uh, the coronavirus and its consequences uh, in the real sense. And uh, how is important to maintain this kind this kind of pandemic, uh, the social distancing. So uh, for me, it was really a good lesson uh, uh, to take home and how to maintain also the, the, the right behaviors to stay in safety with my family, my colleagues and my friends. As a person, as in Italy, we really suffered a lot of coronavirus effects. Uh, I lived uh, this month with uh, really a great sadness in, see, in seeing a lot of victims, especially in Northern Italy. And uh, is, this sadness was uh, really greatest when I saw the same mistake that we did in Italy, repeated in several countries in the world, even in the so-called advanced economics. In some cases, really, we can say that the stupidity as not borders and overcomes economic barriers and social barriers. As a researcher, for me, uh, this time uh, is a time to rethink about uh, what uh, are right to do, what uh, uh, is best uh, to, to follow uh, as a research line, research stream, uh, and uh, how it's important to have uh, a more comprehensive perspective research a broader perspective, and to take in consideration not only the disciplinary, my disciplinary paths, but also a, a sort of uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, path, uh, um, trying to combine social and uh, landscape teams together. I think it's really the, the real challenge that, that we have for the next future, and we have to accept this kind of challenge. Okay, thank you, Giovanni. Um, we'll cover some of these issues later on. Um, let me just now introduce Terry Sunderland. Uh, he joins us from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, uh, where he's a professor. He also has an appointment with C4, right? Um, uh, but he's very well known as a researcher and author for his extensive publications in diverse fields and different ecosystems and different parts of the world, uh, including work in, in landscape ecology. Good morning, Terry. Thanks for being with us at this early hour. It's in, I don't know if, if you have this idea, but it's, it's um, 16 past 6 a.m. in Vancouver. So double thanks to Terry for joining us at this early hour. Uh, so I have the same question for you. Um, how, how is life in Vancouver today? 
Um, two things. Um, one, uh, the weather hasn't, hasn't really helped. Um, we've been on lockdown now for 15 weeks. We're entering our 16th. Um, so the university were very, very quick at closing everything down. So it was a big scrabble to finish the last semester online. Um, but let me reiterate what Cinnamon said, you know, how privileged we are to be able to, you know, have enough space, um, be in houses that are large enough for us all to work together. Our family has spent an inordinate amount of time together. We're still alive. We haven't um, done anything bad to each other. We've had a very good um, interaction over the last four months. Um, and that's been a, a plus uh, to the whole process because normally everyone's sort of in and out the whole time. It's been, and as Giovanni says, you know, to, to sort of reflect on what this means for the future. And I think, you know, you alluded to the, to the fact that we've, we've worked a lot on landscape ecology and other issues in the past, how that can inform the future. And I think we need to look at a, part of the reflection that's happened over the last few months is, is how we can move forward with a much more systems based integrated future that gets away from the systems and the processes that have caused these particular pandemics. And this isn't the first one. This just happens to be the one that's had a major impact. And also looking at the fragility of our economic systems as well. Um, on a personal note, my poor daughter has just graduated from high school. She's um, going to be graduating virtually um, this afternoon. Um, and then she joins UBC as an undergraduate. And she re received the notification yesterday that her first two terms, so her first full year essentially, is going to be online. So for that generation, it's going to be a very different future. Um, and job markets, um, welfare support, all of these things are going to change. Um, and I think we need to be cognizant of that. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge for everybody. But I'd also like to reiterate, thank you for the invitation to join. It doesn't matter about the early morning. I'm an early riser anyway. So thank you. It's our, our pleasure. Uh, so thank you all for accepting being part of this webinar. I'll start with questions more. I mean, all, all the statements that were made were already quite related to, to the topic, but let me ask you some more perhaps specific questions, although I invite you to elaborate on, on these topics uh, at your will. So I'll, I'll start with Sandra, Sandra with, um, and addressing the transmission and spread of, of these kind of diseases. Many people claim that transmission of zoonosis from wild populations to human populations is related to, to the way that we are changing the landscape and the way that we manage the ecosystem. We consider that there is evidence, uh, scientific evidence, that this is the case. That there is, is there indeed a relationship between landscape change and ecosystem change and transmission and spread of, of diseases like this? Yeah, at first I think it's important to, um, to recall that uh, nearly two thirds of the human infectious disease arise from pathogens shared with wild or domestic animals. So this is why it's, it's so important to, to consider this. Uh, and of course, as Terry said, I mean, this, is, this is not the first. Uh, pandemic, you know, if, if we think in history uh, and in general endemic and uh, exotic zoonosis uh, cause about a billion uh, cases of illness in people and millions of deaths actually every year, I mean, without, without taking uh, COVID on, on board. Uh, so this is actually a rising threat to global health that, that is becoming um, worse and worse, but um, the fact is that there's there's many pathogens and disease uh, that that we forget about, that, like toxoplasmosis, that, that brucellosis or rabies or chagas or dengue, and all these, of course, have a direct relation uh, with with habitats. Uh, and, and the main issue is a forest habitat, since we are in a in a euphro, um, a webinar, I think it's important to remember the role of forest in, in that, uh, in perhaps not in, in particular COVID or in part, but in, in general, I mean, I insist, we have, we have more than 60% of, of human infectious disease that are caused by, by, by this kind of pathogens that need a particular habitat that come from nature. So um, just to keep in mind also that we have um, approximately 80% of all species 
uh, that uh, live on forested land. So this is how it's so important for us. And then when we are having this pandemic, which has received actually was the second of June, so very recently, the report from the Global Forest uh, Watch. And there we see that uh, we had just on 2019, 11.9 million hectares of tree cover. Uh, that according to the data of the University of Maryland that uh, leads this report is gone. So this is about a football pitch of primary forest every six seconds. So you can calculate how many of these uh, uh, forest pitch we're going to lose by the end of, of this uh, webinar. So the, the point here is also that the research community and medical community is raising this issue uh, especially in the last 20 years, but we can see um, a lot of articles that are coming in particular from 2010. For 2016, there was this fantastic special issue on landscape disease that was led by Michelle Sieger, and, and she presented the importance of landscape epidemiology and actually how important is the role of landscape ecology uh, considering that uh, we are going to consider, we are going to undertake this holistic vision that we do take in landscape ecology in order to analyze not just um, the species in question, if not also climatology, geology, even archaeology, because we need this temporal um, scale as well in order to understand uh, this, uh, this disease. So um, in, in that sense, I think, uh, well, we're going to talk later about the important role of landscape ecology in order to look at the, this pathogen and host in terms of the models we do uh, on predator prey uh, and other consumers. So, so, so I understand we're going to talk later on, but what is important here is to see that in the measure that we are lo losing more and more habitat, we're going to be exposed more and more to this, um, a transfer of pathogens into humans. And, and this is not stopping because actually when we were all locked down, uh, more deforestation happened in Brazil and actually they were even getting into the, uh, uh, the indigenous reserve where it's forbidden in theory to deforest and will continue to deforest. And many deals with mining companies were happening when everybody was in lockdown. And this I have concrete information from Argentina, from Bolivia and, and from Brazil. So um, it's this combination of the habitat we are losing and this habitat we are losing in a unprecedented rates because you know we must say that we have seen this some few years in 2015 to 2018 where forests started to recover and then we see that with policies like the one Bolsonaro is having like the one Trump is having and and all these companies timber companies and so on that take advantage of, of going uh, to uh, to countries in the south in in, um, in particular in the Republic of Congo in Brazil and in Indonesia to deforest and uh, so, so we are going, I think, to continue even perhaps uh, worse scenarios than the one we just, we just live if we don't actually change, but we, we actually don't change policies and governance in order to protect our habitats. Okay. Thank you very much. And the question I, I have for Terry, it's, it's, it's based on your, your, your answer, actually. Uh, I, I think that there is this trend, or at least many researchers forecast that what we are experiencing today will tend to increase in frequency in, in, the, in the future, which means that pandemics will be more frequent in, in the future due to the, the causes, to the factors that are creating conditions for this to, to happen. And my question for Terry is that if, if, is if, he, if he thinks that this is what is going to happen. So you, you think that um, pandemics like the one that we are experiencing today will, will be more frequent in the future? Um, I wish I had a crystal ball to say yes <laughs> or no, but for sure, um, uh, I'll, as, as I'll um, uh, sort of introduce my intervention, I'll start on the issue of deforestation, but talk about how that has led to an increased in recent pandemics and whether that leads to a trend or not is something we can we can maybe expand on further. So I think one of the most frustrating things about continued deforestation is 
those of us have been in the forest sector for a few years, you know, we've seen the New York Declaration on Forests, where forest destruction will be halved by 2020, halted by 2030. None of those commitments have actually led to any firm reduction in deforestation. And here we are in 2020, uh, deforestation has not been halved. Um, agricultural expansion and intensification remain the greatest driver of forest loss. Um, and most of that loss is permanent. Now, there's a big difference between maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago, where a lot of forest transformation was relatively temporary, whether it be through the forest production, Sweden agriculture, et cetera. But the permanent transformation from go for commodity crops, particularly those that we all like to consume, I'm sure many of us have a cup of coffee in front of us, um, soy, cattle, oil palm. Uh, oil palm obviously is in pretty much everything we consume, um, whether we like it or not, cocoa, coffee, sugar. These are all consumer-led commodities that are driving deforest deforestation. So unwittingly, we're all kind of responsible. So we need to take some, some level of responsibility there. But it's also about maximizing yields. Um, and we like our cheap food systems, but it's resulted in an extreme simplification of our ecological systems and the loss of farmland biodiversity. And this has had a massive impact, not only on our food systems, but on the exposure to infectious diseases with the majority being passed as as Sandra rightly pointed out, from animals to human, that spillover effect. So in the last 20 years alone, um, humanity is hit by three coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, and now this dreadful pandemic of COVID-19. One influenza virus, swine flu, two arboviruses, chikungunya and Zika. And sadly, I have ex um, experienced chikungunya when I was living in Indonesia, it's not pleasant. Um, and numerous localized outbreaks of uh, Ebola, which is a filovirus. Um, but they've increased in the last 20 years. And this has coincided with the expansion of commodity production, the simplification of our landscapes, and the concomitant loss of biodiversity. And that's really important. So the link between agricultural de driven deforestation and synotic eff effects have been really sort of proven, particularly in terms of uh, e Ebola. So one major problem with deforestation is it brings humans and wildlife into ever increasing proximity. So you increase the uh, risk of spillover. And it's amazing that the, the current forest estate um, is estimated 70% of that estate is now within one kilometer of a forest edge. So we see how much we fragmented our forests uh, throughout the world. And that um, proximity to a forest edge increases human wildlife, human pathogen interaction. So an another point that um, basically uh, to remember is that pathogens may be more prevalent in simplified systems uh, with reduced levels of biodiversity. So diverse host communities tend to include less competent reservoir species, lowering the risk of spillover. So basically that means that more biodiverse systems have inherent controls on how these pathogens are spread. The more you simplify those systems, there's no sort of uh, dilution effect, if you like, of biodiversity to, to mitigate the spread of these, these pathogens. Excuse me, I'll just have a quick uh, green tea here. So the emergence of um, uh, large numbers of genetically similar livestock, particularly in the forest frontier, has also facilitated this role um, and provide um, many pathogens with the opportunity to mutate and become transmissible to humans. And when I first arrived in Indonesia in 2006, we were at the height of the avian flu, um, which was spread only because of the industrial poultry farming that characterized much, as, much of our uh, farming systems. So we need to really look at our global fist, uh, food system and think about what's the question to ask, is it really fit for purpose in its current form? What has it done for us both for, in terms of nutrition, but also in terms of exposure to these pathogens? So consumption patterns that cause biodiversity loss tend to also be those that are resulting in unhealthy diets. Now there's an inherent paradox there that our farming systems are not only exposing us to pathogens, but they're also resulting in um, poor malnutrition uh, outcomes in many respects, poor dietary diversity outcomes in many respects, and the focus on calories has led to this increase um, of expansion of, of agriculture into, into forested lands. Um, and again, it, exacerbating that uh, potential uh, spillover effect. But obviously one of the most contentious issues here uh, is wildlife and bushmeat, and this has been the subject of a lot of debate over the last few months. So there are two uh, sort of pillars of, of this as far as uh, I can see. One is that bushmeat is extremely important for local people in terms of 
uh, animal protein sources, particularly in the absence of livestock species. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a trade which then uh, is supplying a luxury market, if you like, um, to urban dwellers who don't actually need the protein. They can get alternative sources. So there are a lot of calls at the moment to ban all wild meat or bushmeat uh, hunting and, and trade. And we need to look at the more nuanced aspects of that to understand you know, how, how important are these resources for human nutrition um, and where is the cutoff in terms of understanding where they become a risk in terms of the spillover of pathogens. Um, and that takes me into the point, of, a very quick point about wet markets. Um, not all wet markets contain bushmeat. I lived in Indonesia for 12 years. Um, most of the markets are wet markets. They do not contain bushmeat or other wild animals. They're just basically markets that use water to keep everything fresh. And it's very rare that you'll find um, any animal that would provide any risk in terms of spillover. They tend to be fruit and veg, fish, um, and domestic livestock species um, that are found in these markets. So again, we can't take a blanket ban on, on wet markets as, as an indicator or as a possibility to, to stop the spread of some of these pathogens. It's about the, the, the use of and the, the trade of wildlife within those systems. Um, in, in situ, forests are uh, important safety nets and what we see um, in terms of crises like this and, and if you look at the current uh, urban to rural migration in India um, there's some parts of West Africa, particularly Nigeria, um, loss of unemployment, poverty is exacerbating uh, the human state. Many people are moving back to their rural areas, so they need land to farm. Um, people are motivated into um, uh, timber production, charcoal production, which is a major issue, energy, uh, energy support needed uh, to provide cooking materials. So we're going to see a huge increase in pressure on forest resources. Um, over the next few months, few years, because of that um, economic impact of COVID in, in many ways. Um, and I think that's, that's it. again, going to be a huge issue. So there are, everything's kind of inter interlinked, but there is no cookie cutter approach to, to solving some of these issues. And I think I hate for research, researchers to say, hey, we need more research, but there are lots of gaps in our research that we do need to start thinking about um, and not think about just blanket bans on wildlife blanket bounds on wet, wet markets. We need to understand how these systems work, but also how they inter interconnect. And that goes back to my earlier point about the systems approach to understanding the, the, uh, the, the connections between uh, integrated landscapes, smallholder farmers, wild meat, and the urbanization uh, that goes with it, and the economic system that drives rural to urban migration. And then when that collapses, the urban to uh, rural migration that's going to have a huge impact on standing forests. Okay, thanks, Terry. Um, my next question goes to Cinnamon, and this is more related to responses for, from society to this COVID pandemic. Um, and my question <clears throat> is how do you analyze the ways that regions and countries and communities responded to this pandemic and how these responses impacted people, societies and the, the environment. What do you think about the consequences of, of the responses? Um, it, it has been, uh, so from, from the Chilean perspective, um, sure. I'm going to start with that because that's the one that I know the most. It is impressive how we need to understand that context matters for decision making and how do you face problems. Um, so we thought of ourselves uh, as a super developed country that we can copy what other developed countries have done and apply it here and it was going to work. And surprise, it didn't work. People uh, approach lockdowns, approach uh, harsh economic measures in different ways. People have a, a cultural context that makes them respond in, 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 in different ways. And also the economy of the country is super important on how people are going to be able to respond to measures like a lockdown, a mandatory lockdown. So, and, and that repeats through uh, Latin America quite a lot. Uh, so we have to 
realize that the economic system that we have on state right now is super fragile, that it creates a lot of inequities and uh, that are not really um, visible to everybody. So it has come to quite a surprise, especially for decision makers, that the country was poorer than they thought. And it also, uh, you become aware how the, the ones that are much more fragile are immigrants usually, that do not have a legal status in the country that can really receive aid uh, from the government. So uh, kind of linking it to what Terry said is that we need to understand the system and we also need to have the different voices that we have in a society involved in decision making and involved in improving and making our system a little bit stronger. So um, there are people that don't have anything to eat if they don't go out to work. So they get the money for eating through the work of the day. So that doesn't happen really in very developed countries. You can see it in the United States, definitely, but I'm not sure if you can see it in Europe that much. So there's some things that we need to be aware of that we were completely blind at this moment. So that it's gonna make us, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that this pandemic also help us improve our economic system, improve um, making the quality of life of everybody to be a little bit better. Uh, pro probably not perfect for everybody, but a little bit better. And also um, looking at how, uh, again, with, with people that have less, how they're not uh, exposed to nature. So you get in lockdown, you live in a tiny apartment with a lot of people in that tiny apartment. And the only thing you see from your window is concrete and nothing else. So that is also another thing that uh, we kind of knew, but it's be again becoming much more visible that uh, not a lot of people have access to green. Uh, over here, all the parks were closed. So your only chance to have some green in your life through the lockdown was looking out your window, being able to maybe walk in your street. So it's a, it's a street, a street you can be exposed to some nature and that doesn't happen for a lot of people. So also how we can improve that, uh, if, uh, especially since this is probably going to become a little bit more often. Um, so how, how, ca how can we, from the exposure to nature side, uh, improve uh, also the quality of life of, of urban citizens? And, and the other point, it's how can we also make everybody to understand that nature is valuable, is valuable for people living in the city, is valuable the nature outside the city also for us, and it's valuable for people living out the city. So how can we make everybody aware that nature is gonna protect us, is not a threat? So yes, pandemic come from wildlife, but it's because we simplify system, we low diversity, and that is the issue. So it's our problem. So how can we start valuing nature a little bit more so we can change decision making, we can change economic ways, we can change a little bit the food system, and we can start like promoting, uh, I don't know, urban agriculture a little bit more, especially again, in this pandemic, it becomes super important to maybe have a neighborhood with some gardens so you can trade food uh, when you can not really go out to pick up food or go to the grocery store. Um, so those, I think those are the things that I see as also an opportunity. So looking at this pandemic, not only on the downside, but also as a catalyzer of we can, we can change here. We can improve as humans and we can improve with the help of nature and not against nature. So we start changing the values 
uh, towards biodiversity, towards forests, and realizing how important they are for our lives. Okay, thank you for the positive message. Uh, the question I had for Giovanni is, is somehow related to what you have just said. Um, one of the things that we have learned with the pandemic is that the, the landscape around us, where we live, where we spend lockdown, uh, matters. It has an effect on us and in our health. Uh, Giovanni, you, you have a particular interest on that topic and you have actually thought and worked about it. Do you want to share with us some, some of the ideas that you have about health and uh, lockdown and COVID pandemics? Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, Joel. Uh, I would like to, 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 to go on with the talk of uh, Cinnamon uh, because I agree completely with her about how it's important not to have only one prescription to solve the problem in the world. In each country, we have a different context, and so we need to adapt the solution for combating COVID and also the effect of the lockdown with different prescription in the different countries. So the economical, the cultural, and the social context is really very, very, very important. And is crucial to go in the contest and uh, to, uh, to study exactly the different links between the different uh, uh, component of, uh, of, the, of the system, social, cultural, economic, uh, and natural system, I mean. Uh, as you said uh, before, I've tried to, to, to study the COVID and the lockdown effects in several countries. I have also research with the cinema in common, and uh, we are going Published the first result uh, about the perception of the green urban spaces, uh, in, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, in uh, Europe, uh, uh, we, uh, we have uh, different countries uh, with, with different uh, types uh, of lockdowns. In Italy, for example, uh, we close everything for two months uh, and the people remain isolated, completely isolated in the home. Uh, only for very, very few motivation uh, uh, was allowed to go, uh, to go out. In other countries, uh, uh, the authorities, the public authorities uh, uh, reduced uh, the social mobility, but allowed the visitor to green spaces. So uh, about this topic, uh, I started during the lockdown uh, uh, a research, and the first results of this research uh, highlight how is important to have only the mayor's site uh, or to be near to the public or private green spaces because these uh, uh, to stay in close to the the private or to the public green spaces uh, allowed uh, to limit some psychological damage i mean uh, anxiety sleep disturbance insecurity towards the future and these uh, effects uh, were more evident in people not having the opportunity to stay close to the green spaces. So uh, it's a really important uh, to have a nature uh, close to, to the house, close to the home. And for the future, it's important uh, planning a different kind of uh, cities with uh, a green infrastructure uh, in the cities and not only Around, around the cities. Another topic uh, really interesting to study for, for the future is uh, the relationship between air pollution, I mean, uh, uh, ultra fine particular matter, and the spread of COVID. And how is it possible to, to tackle uh, this pollution with the green spaces? There is an interesting uh, uh, research published uh, just uh, four weeks ago by Harvard University about the relationship between mortality, the percentage of mortality uh, with the content of, of ultrafine uh, uh, particle matter in the uh, atmosphere. And uh, what is important is that very, very few increment in ultrafine uh, pollution uh, can cause uh, a, a big uh, increase in mortality due to 
uh, the, um, the, the COVID coronavirus. Uh, what we can try to sum up uh, uh, after this exper our experience uh, in, uh, in, uh, in coronavirus and COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in the global level. First of all, that we, are, we were not prepared to manage, manage uh, the pandemic. Uh, also, the manage the city, the public spaces, also the, the green spaces that, in my opinion, have a high potential to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and to maintain the people healthy. It also interesting that uh, I read uh, at the beginning uh, uh, of June uh, in New York uh, how there is a lot of interest for the people uh, after the pandemic. Uh, to distrust the, the crowded cities in place. And today, not only in the United States, but also in France and Italy too, there are a lot of people interested in leaving cities or going to live in suburbs or in small towns in the countryside. Now there are a lot of people, especially Archistar or planner, urban planner, that in, in the newspaper, Italian newspaper, are telling about the new renaissance of the village uh, and because the, the, uh, in the, the rural settlement uh, in Italy, uh, in many cases, these rural set settlements were COVID-free places. So now there is a new interest for the people to go out uh, from the cities and to establish uh, uh, themselves in the countryside. Also from this perspective uh, uh, for our community of, uh, as a, a landscape ecologist uh, is important to study what kind of relationship, what is the, the right approach in trying to organize uh, this kind of movement from city to the countryside. So maybe is another challenge for our community. Thank you, Giovanni. And this actually, it's a good it's a good topic to introduce the the next question. The, the next question is for all the, the the guests, and it's related to the role of landscape ecology uh, and science in, in general to to find solutions for pandemics. And I would like you, each of you, starting with Sandra, to to address these these topics uh, that are. In my my point of view, important for 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 the future of of landscape ecology and society at the same time, uh, the expected impact of pandemics in the landscape ecology research agenda, and you can you can make it. Uh, I mean, you can apply it to to research or ecological or science uh, agenda, agenda in general, and as well as the obligation of landscape ecology community to become involved in solutions for evolving societal problems. So this is uh, on, on, on the side of, of science, how can our work um, improve the, the capacity of societies to deal with, with pandemics? What do we have to change in terms of research agenda and also in terms of involvement in, in activities that go beyond the, the usual things that we do as researchers? So, Sandra, can we start with you? Um, yeah, I, I, I talk a bit at the beginning, but I think that it's extremely important to understand. I think this pandemic served perhaps for that purpose in order to understand that infectious disease is beyond the scale of uh, individual clinical cases and, and requires, absolutely requires the assessment of ecologically and even evolutionary perspectives. Um, an epidemic, um, as I said before, is, is fundamentally an interaction between a uh, population of, of two species in terms of the pathogen and the host. Uh, and has this, this, this uh, similarities of what we do with the predator, prey, and other uh, consumer resource system, systems that um, ecologists um, have been studying already for, for decades. The problem is that we, we see in literature, there's very, very few studies where you see uh, people coming from, uh, from medicine, from medical science, working with ecologists in general, and I will get in the, into landscape ecology, 
So we have in 2012, in a very nice publication that was published in Lancet by um, William Kirish, which is a very well known in the Eco Health Alliance uh, in New York, with people like Andy Dobson uh, from Princeton in evolution and ecology, and, and many others like key scientists, uh, that they published a fantastic article on in ecology and zoonosis, natural and unnatural stories. Um, and this is, and there's just very few of that. So, um, so, so the fact is, are we going to have, and I know there's plans and, and funding in particular for European Union on that, but how truly, um, not just interdisciplinary are going to be, because this is transdisciplinary uh, in terms of how we're going to, to work. And, and going to landscape ecology, I mean, because of our holistic vision, and because we know quite a lot in terms of models of the spread of the disturbance and spatial models in how things happen at different scales and, and how they can spread. Uh, we have a major role to play, but also because we are going to, we are good to combine different layers of information. So not just geophysical ones, uh, but also, which, you know, ecologists do very well, if not also in terms of landscape archaeology, um, in terms of environmental and economic history, uh, because we need as well these important variables to play a role. So, so I think is um, as landscape ecologists, we, we have um, a main role to play and we hope to have the opportunity, but just not continue working, you know, among us because that we know how to do it, but how we can really work uh, with, uh, with sociologists, with economists, uh, and in particular with medical science. You know, we know medical science, usually uh, they are mainly in, in a very um, different cocoon, which is not ours. So, so this is what I think we need, but we do have the tools uh, and it's proven in the past, even how uh, remote sensing has been um, helping enor enormously tracking vegetation density that correlates. It's a very nice study, a study that uh, vegetation density that correlates with breeding site for the vector of Rift Valley uh, fever that has been used to forecast cases of disease and also the need for vaccine, vaccine supply in particular areas to pinpoint areas where you know, this help is needed. So we do have the tools to really be able to work with the other uh, colleagues at the other science, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary on, on the topic. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Um, Terry, uh, same question f for you. I mean, what do you, you, you already mentioned a few things related to this question. But what do you think that will change in the research agenda of landscape ecology of, or science in, in general and how we as, as scientists, as researchers, will be more involved in, in societal uh, responses for, for problems like, like this pandemic? Well, I, I think as I alluded to earlier, um, the research has shown that um, we need to break down silos. We need to break down the silos of agriculture, forestry, and other land uses into much more integrated approaches. The current paradigm of integrated landscape management grew out of the science of landscape ecology. Um, and I think that we need to go back to, to thinking about how landscape ecology and the broader social aspects of landscape management can create a more systems approach to, to, to managing our land. Breaking down those silos and those strong divisions between agriculture and forestry that basically got us into this pickle in the first place. Um, and, I, and I think that there's great scope to build upon that, knowing that we, we're not doing a very good job with either agriculture or forestry. Agricultural systems not leading to very good nutrition and, and um, food security outcomes, and our forestry policies are still promoting deforestation. So we need to think about a different way to approach um, the way we manage our land. There are sort of four main solutions in, in, in my mind. The, the, the way we produce food needs to be seriously thought about. We need to move away from factory farming, intensive agricultures. We've created a global food system that's totally reliant on calories. So the, the, the linear thinking is with 50, uh, uh, 10 billion people by 2050, we need more food. That's not the case. That's, if that's a, 
um, a calorie based projection. Yes, it's true. But we already grow enough calories to feed the, food, to feed the current um, uh, human population. What we need to do is diversify those diets into much more agricultural, uh, e agro ecosystem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, put a greater emphasis on nutrition and dietary diversity. But we also need to think about smallholder farmers who produce an exponential amount of food in the world. And they produce these, these, th this food in very, very complex landscape mosaics, which are much more resilient to these types of um, spillovers for pathogens. So we need to think about how we can integrate smallholders in a much more meaningful way. They get very little support despite uh, the amount of food they produce, no subsidies, um, no market support, etc. So that's one way of, of thinking about how our global food system is responsible for um, some of these, these drivers of negative change. The second one is to restore forests and land that support agriculture. Restoration is currently, uh, I've just seen a whole bunch of uh, emails within the C4 aircraft um, uh, system this morning. Uh, complaining about the BBC piece that came out yesterday saying that um, planting trees is not always good um, and in many respects that's true to go out and plant a billion eucalyptus uh, is not going to have a huge impact on your ecology for restoration needs to be well thought through we need to focus on native species of utilitarian value and also support the fact that forests do support agriculture there's a, a theme of work we're working on right now which shows that forests and trees can improve yields, so that they can obviously through pollination services, through um, uh, soil nutrition, through water regulation, climate regulation. So there, are, there is scope for, for integrating tr forests, trees and agriculture into these complex landscapes that have better outcomes both for agriculture and for forestry. The other thing is, is looking at sustainable supply chains. I talked about commodities earlier. We need to promote consumption patterns that reduce the impact on biodiversity focus on fair trade, certification and labelling. These are not always perfect, um, but it's at least a means for, for the consumers to understand uh, and know where their products uh, um, derive and they can make an informed choice about whether they buy those products. And we need you know, real information about the environmental, social uh, and economic impacts of growing some of these commodity crops in the systems that we do. And we're seeing the manifestation of that right now. Um, and the final point um, or for final solution is we need to value natural capital much more. Um, forests and natu other natural systems are always you know, worth less than commodity production because our natural capital is dramatically and drastically undervalued. And we need to think about ways that we can value our natural capital much more um, instead of uh, the opportunity cost of, of oil palm being $2,000 a hectare. What about the ecosystem service value of a standing patch of forest being worth $10,000 per hectare? It's about a different way of thinking and we need to get the, the economic community to think about how we can um, fairly um, and equitably thinking about forests uh, and other natural resources for more than not just intrinsic value but their financial value and this sort of implies basically we need a much more open um, thinking in terms of multidisciplinarity interdisciplinarity <laughs> break down the barriers of academia as well as break down the barriers um, related to to land use so I think that's from my perspective uh, one of the, the, the ways forward okay thank you Terry very important thoughts. Uh, Cinnamon, <laughs> your turn to, to make your, <laughs> your comments um, on these responses from the landscape ecology and science uh, sector. Sorry, I have a cuckoo clock, so there's background that's, music that's nice. for my answer. <laughs> um, yeah, so one other thought is, is that uh, we need to keep continue thinking as landscape as social ecological systems they're not just landscape they have people on them they have people related to those so it's not only about the politicians but uh, or decision makers or the people that manage the land but it's the community that uses a, that land so connecting it to the food system again or connecting it to uh, for afforestation or uh, restoration we need to understand the local context and how that forest is used and how that uh, links to the rest of the different land use existing around that forest in order to improve the resilience of that landscape, but also in order to improve the benefits we obtain for the landscape and in order to protect 
ourselves from any vulnerability we have with uh, um, pathogens. So, so I think we need to strengthen that. We need to make it more robust and, and, and more transferable to the people that make the decisions. Um, and of course, taking the local context into account uh, to kind of model our research question or, or kind of direct our research questions to. And, and the second part, which uh, because I'm an urban ecologist, I love it, is we really need to think how green infrastructure connects to natural landscape and how the movement occurring through uh, the natural to the green infrastructure and back is working and, and can eventually, again, protect us, make us more resilient, make uh, human well-being a little bit better. And I think with that, we can tackle inequalities from a different perspective, from the urban dwellers to also the rural uh, dwellers. So I think that is super important. The landscape is not separated. So it's everything is connected and we need to be a little bit more aware of that. And, um, and finally, I think we need to somehow uh, definitely increase the value of natural capital. Um, I'm completely agreeing with what Terry uh, mentioned. Uh, if we're capable to do that, we're gonna be capable to improve conservation, to do valuable reforestation, not just plantations uh, and, and thinking of overcoming not only COVID but also thinking of a much larger problem that we are going to have in the near future which is climate change. Uh, so how those uh, reforestation, afforestation efforts go towards climate change not just eucalyptus or pine plantations um, which I think is super important thinking again about biodiversity, thinking about again how that biodiversity is going to make us more resilient. So not just keeping the mind on the COVID, but also thinking a little bit forward, how can we address climate change too? Okay, thank you. And, um, very good points. And it seems there is a convergence of, of points of view, which is, which is good. Giovanni, you are the last guest. To, to address this, these topics, what changes do we need in science and in terms of involvement of scientists in society from your point of view? Uh, thanks, uh, Joao. I completely agree with my colleagues uh, and what uh, they stated before. Uh, I'm quite confident uh, that the science and the landscape ecology can offer a uh, solution for more sustainability and resilient cities uh, for the future, uh, especially with uh, cinnamon, with the, we are interested in common. And uh, uh, green spaces for me can constitute in the future uh, really uh, the backbone of the, uh, the, of the city of the future. I mean, uh, we need to have a green infrastructure also at the urban level as a, a crucial component of the city not as a residual residual component or filling element as, uh, as happening uh, in the current days. Uh, the green spaces uh, in this perspective uh, can be uh, our common home and where we can have, where we can relate to the others also during the epidemic, a pandemic event. COVID and global change, good question, uh, Cinnamon. Maybe there are a lot of relation between uh, them. Uh, surely uh, are, are related uh, about the quality of life, uh, how are resilient uh, the, the cities and living uh, in the crowded places uh, to take uh, the effect of, uh, of, of the COVID. Now, the uh, um, European Commission launched, uh, just launched uh, the new Green Deal. And uh, I think uh, that uh, this uh, is an opportunity for us uh, for uh, the recovery, uh, not only the economic, but also the health recovery after the pandemic. But taking into consideration what uh, Michael is uh, the opportunity for, uh, 
uh, I think uh, that is in now the time not only for having uh, a uh, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach for solving and for analyzing before solving, because it is, is important to analyze before uh, uh, a, a proposal for solving a problem. Maybe is the time for found, for establish a new science, uh, a new science that, that uh, can uh, some uh, some competence coming from different dominion. I mean, uh, before we, we spoke about uh, the medical sector, uh, the economical sector, the social sector, and landscape ecology sector. Maybe we have to merge the different competences, uh, and also to change uh, not only the perspective uh, uh, for the, uh, analyzing the problem, but also the, the terminology. We need uh, to have a new language uh, uh, the, new, the new language is not important only for uh, uh, to speak to each other between us, the community of the researchers, but also how to transfer uh, from the shine side to the political side and to the, uh, the common lay side. But it is really important because if I am confident in the shines, I'm not so confident in the political side. And, uh, for me, uh, one of the challenges I want to, to accept for the future is uh, to try to transfer more as possible this competence from the uh, scientific side to the practical side, I mean the political and the administrative side. Okay, very good point. So if you allow me to, to summarize uh, some of the key points that were mentioned by, by our guests, uh, first one is that landscapes matter, they affect uh, us, they affect the spread of diseases, but also affect our health. Um, landscape ecology has a lot to offer in terms of models, methods, and also the holistic perspective that can be uh, useful for the new societies, new landscapes, um, pandemic-free or safe. Um, more transdisciplinary science is, is needed. We need to find the new language to communicate uh, knowledge and um, tools from science to decision making. Uh, transformation of society is also needed to reduce pressures on ecosystems and biodiversity. Also restoration of forests, of natural forests is needed. Um, landscapes uh, as social, social ecological systems are fundamental to address resilience and sustainability. And local context should be taken into account in research and development. And finally, um, natural capital and ecosystem services need to be valued in order to assure uh, the supply of <laughs> ecosystem services and maintenance of ecosystems and improve our well well-being so this these are some of the the topics that you mentioned it was it was a very rich uh, webinar with many ideas which is also a reflex of the complexity of, of the the topics that we are dealing with in in this this area uh, we are uh, i mean one hour and nine minutes after uh, the beginning. So it's, it's time to, to finish this, this webinar. I'd like to, to ask each of our guests uh, for a very short final uh, statement about your expectations for the, for the near future, for the future months and possibly years in our planet, uh, taking into account uh, not just the, the pandemic situation, but also the things that we we have discussed in, in this especially in, in this last part of, of your interventions so can i have um, your final statement andrea well this is uh, first of all it's a shame we cannot exchange with the public so for next time we'll learn that we need more time mm -hmm. um but uh well i think one lesson we all learn from this is that we need to also um you know, it's something that we all know very well, you know, trying to think and act more local 
uh, but we know of the of the global consequences. Uh, but in terms of consumption and in terms of our actions, um, I think we need to think and consume much more local, uh, which which is uh, quite important for this, and and listen more what what you know the society have uh, to say. Um, I think politicians in particular need to listen much more so to create a much more coherent and human society. Okay, thanks Terry. Final yeah. statement? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think these are unprecedented times, uh, not just, <clears throat> excuse me, not just in the COVID-19, but <clears throat> with the, the economic collapse, it shows the fragility of our, of our global economy, the social unrest that's accompanying that, um, we live in completely unprecedented times that, that I would hope will galvanize society into thinking about how we can do things better. And as I mentioned earlier, younger generation are kind of getting it um, and they're going to be the leaders in the future. And I, and I think they're going to go through some major hardships in the short term. But I think in the longer term, their vision, their approach um, and their commitment to do the right thing is going to is going to win out in the end, and 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 we'll see changes in political systems and economic systems, and I hope in environmental systems as well. Um, and I think as as more um, senior uh, people who have got a bit more experience, hopefully we can guide that process uh, as well. And I think we have a huge responsibility to do so. Okay, thanks a lot, Terry. Cinema, your last message. Um. So I think we are aware that we're all vulnerable. Nobody is uh, completely safe or completely protected. So that's one of the things that I, I think is super important to keep in mind. And then that there is a huge opportunity now for changing in a positive way, for improving our economic system uh, and, and for start to make the right decision or better decision for the future that we should have as a whole society. And, and the second part is that we shouldn't forget uh, that environment is part of our economic system. So we shouldn't be losing uh, all environmental regulations for the sake of economy improvement in the upcoming uh, years. So that's the second thing that links completely to deforestation. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Giovanni, last I, message. I have, I have to repeat uh, what my colleagues that uh, told before. Uh, I hope uh, in a more careful shines uh, towards the most fragile categories of society, elderly people, poor people, immigrants, for example who are more exposed, exposed not only in the current health emergency, but also in the economic crisis. We are living an economic crisis. We are living from a decade in economic crisis, not only in Europe, but at the global level. For this reason, I hope in a shines with an integrated ecological vision. And what I said before is important also for the research for the scientists to change uh, uh, approach in telling uh, not only between the community, our community, but also out of the community, and uh, to try to press, to urge uh, the politicians to pay more attention to the, to the safeguard of the natural resources and uh, this, towards the sustainability in the real sense. So maybe for the future, uh, also for the community of uh, landscape ecologists, landscape ecology is important to have a, a double production, not only the scientific production, but also uh, more op opinion uh, uh, papers uh, uh, addressed uh, to the politicians, uh, to the stakeholders, uh, in order to find this kind of a solution. Okay, Thank thanks a lot. Um, and with this round of statements, I'd like to finish this webinar, thanking in first place all the four speakers for their wisdom and willingness to participate in the webinar, including Terry and uh, Terry in particular. Thanks also to all of those who attended the webinar from the other side. 
I think the maximum number of people were 72. Uh, that's the, the maximum that I, I noticed. We were expecting 300, so 72 <laughs> is not so bad. But uh, this is also something to learn for the, the coming webinars. Um, as, as mentioned, this is the first of a series of webinars. So follow our web pages and subscribe the mailing list to receive news and updates on our events and initiatives, including the webinars. And thanks again to all of you, in particular the speakers, um, for your contribution. Um, that's it. Stay safe. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Yes, thank you. All right. We'll speak more. Okay. Sied, I'm seeing you. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for the okay. nice webinar. Thank you so right. much. Okay. I, I forgot to apologize for not allowing questions from, from the audience, but um, we didn't have time. So that's, as, as Sandra mentioned, next time next time we'll, we'll have a period of questions and answers. No, no, no. More, more interaction. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Jose just sent a message. Hope everything is okay in Argentina. Okay, guys, I'm going to switch this off. It was a pleasure to have you attending the, the webinar. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you next time.